Hey everybody, it's me, Gilstrom, your father figure and uh, little, little, little nice guy, little, little man. Uh, so a few things that I want to bring up real quick is uh, thanks so much to everyone who checked out the latest Final Fantasy video. If you haven't checked it out yet, uh, there'll be a little thing up here for you to click on. But uh, uh, it was a weird experiment to try and do something with Final Fantasy. If you're unfamiliar with the game Final Fantasy XIV, it's a game that I play very, very often. Uh, I think I have like over 50 days clocked in real playtime, uh, and I'm not the kind of person to just leave a game running when I'm not playing it. Uh, so it's it's definitely good by by my standards and by most MMO standards. But I recognize that with the new expansion coming out, not a lot of people are super familiar with it. They've really only played games like Elder Scrolls Online, uh, World of Warcraft, Neverwinter, or other MMOs like that, very fantasy-based games. So I wanted to do a quick little video about what exactly you get out of Final Fantasy XIV as a new player. There's a bunch of really cool stuff that you get without even actually paying for the game. We've all heard that same old dead meme of, have you heard the critically acclaimed MMORPG Final Fantasy XIV with an expanded free trial which you can play through the entirety of Realmborn and the award-winning Heavensward expansion up to level 60 for free with no restrictions on playtime. But there's some truth to that. It may just be a meme at face value, but there's a lot that actually goes into it. Um, you do get to play a long amount of the game. I think someone clocked it in at about 100 hours worth, give or take, of, of just pure main story quest content. Um, but the important thing is that unlike other MMOs where you have one character that has your particular class on it, in Final Fantasy XIV, you're able to basically level up any class or in, in this case jobs up to level 60 and you get most of them for free basically i think the limitations are you get no samurai you get no gunbreaker and dancer and soon to be reaper and sage but uh what's really nice about that is that it gives you a good chance to try out different characters different play styles and find out what really works for you so whereas if you are mainly a healer in most MMOs, like World of Warcraft, you can definitely try out tanking without having to replay through the same story over and over and over again to really understand how the class works. And I think that's probably one of the biggest draws for me as an altaholic. I've played tons of MMOs and I, the biggest complaint that I've had has always been, I don't want to play through the the same story again. I don't want to sit through the same boring fetch quests every single time because it's mind numbing and it's boring and you just want to get to that next dungeon. But in Final Fantasy, we don't really worry about that because as you progress through the main story, you can switch out characters, do side quests, do dungeons, complete different logs, killing different monsters or gathering, and it's all there for you out in the open there's there's no weird paywalls behind oh if you want to you want to play this character instead of your main one you have to you have to you know buy this premium service it's just if you have the game have access to those characters now like i said some some of the jobs are going to be locked behind expansions but that's to be expected with any any large scale mmo like this so a couple of things that i really wanted to talk about uh, with this video is the jobs themselves and kind of things that I wish I knew getting into Final Fantasy when I first started. Now, I've been playing for a while. I've been playing for a couple of years. And when I first got, when I first jumped into uh, Final Fantasy, I started out in the, in the very end of the third, I'm sorry, of the second expansion, Stormblood. Now, Stormblood was a very uh, sort of Eastern inspired expansion following the course of things like the samurai we've also seen a couple of relations to things like final fantasy 6 with with the dome empire and stuff like that but uh one thing that i never really understood when i started was what class do i pick because for me i've always been a healer main i i played restoration shamans in wow i played life staff in uh in elder scrolls online i mean in lord of the rings i tried playing the one healing class that you could. And it, to me, having the freedom of choice is one thing, but knowing where my choices lead is entirely different. 
I just want to go through a little breakdown of what each of the individual classes eventually turn into. Because for each of these classes, at level 30, you'll be able to get a quest that will turn the job from one thing into another, from a class into a job. So for example, if you start out with one of our tanks, at, you get to pick one of two at the very beginning, which is going to be our gladiator and our marauder. Now, both of these play pretty similarly at the start. You have your, your defensive abilities as a tank, and then you have your main rotation, and you have your, your area of effect rotation, which I'll call AoEs here. And as you protect your party, you'll be gaining more things called defensives, which are basically ways to protect yourself from incoming attacks. But that's kind of where the similarities stop, because where the gladiator has its very classic sword and shield combo, very, uh, very classical fantasy, where you block with your shield and you stun people and you throw your shield at people. The Marauder is kind of a weird take. This is probably one of the only games where I've seen a two-handed weapon be used as a tanking implement. And to me, it works really well. When you take a look at games like Dungeons and Dragons, for example, you, you always see people playing barbarians and, and they have this innate defensive capability. And we see that replicated here in Final Fantasy, where instead of having, you know, a shield to protect you and, you know, relying on parrying, all of your defense comes with how hard it is to hit you, how hard it is to hurt you, with some abilities healing you, some restoring health, some giving you just raw defense and hurting people in return. It's really fantastic, whereas the Gladiator gets more abilities centered around damage prevention as opposed to regenerating, if that makes sense. Now, each of these each of these two classes turn into the Paladin and the Warrior, respectively. Now, it's very interesting to see how these, in fact, break down because the, the Warrior is by far one of the most fun tanking classes I've played, at least for the vanilla classes, um, which are from A Realm of Born or, or the vanilla base game that we'll get access to. One of the coolest things about this is the fact that you get, everything just feels good about Warrior. There was an ability where I was like, I don't really see a point to this. I find myself using ability after ability after ability, and it just sort of flows well for me. From a power fantasy standpoint, I love the idea of a barbarian tank that just runs in, rushes in, takes a guy out, moves to the next one, spins around with his giant weapon. It just feels good to me. And then we have Paladin, which is, for me, they do a really good job of making it feel like that, that classical fantasy knight. You have your sword, your shield, your protective magics, but they have something special in here. And you'll see some of these abilities later on as you progress the class. They get things like damage spells, they get protective auras. They actually have an ability at later levels where they put a shield up and everyone behind them takes reduced damage. And I think that is the coolest thing to have for a shield tank. Very similar to how characters like, like Reinhardt and Overwatch function, getting behind your tank actually matters in this, in this situation. And it feels so good. It feels so good and refreshing to, to have that, that little bit of separation from other games because we've never, we've never really seen that in other MMOs, functionally anyway. Thematically, of course, of course, but never functionally. Now, moving on to, to the healers, the healers are very synonymous with Final Fantasy in general. We have our Conjurers, and we have our Arcanists. Now, both of these function very, very differently because they're two different types of healers. We have our Conjurer, who is our pure healer, and we have our Arcanist, who's more of a shield healer. At the very beginning, Arcanist is going to function in, in mainly a, a damage role, but I'll explain that in a minute. Let's focus on Conjurer here. So Conjurer is your basic bread and butter priest or cleric or main healer boy or girl. You have your baseline healing spells, regenerative abilities, big AOE heals, uh, and that's basically where they sit. In Final Fantasy, they've always had a special place as the healing class. Sure, other classes get the ability to heal their allies or buff them, but none are quite so iconic as the White Mage. Now, with the Arcanist, however, 
The Arcanist is sort of a weird job because it's the only job in the game that actually splits off into two. You start, at Arc you start as Arcanist in the very beginning, where you get a nice little carbuncle pet that can you know, help you out in, in dungeons and help you with questing. But as you progress, you're, you're given a choice. You can either go the path of the Summoner, or you can go the path of the Scholar. Now, the Scholar uses fairy magic to shield and protect their allies, as opposed to just straight healing them, which is, I think, very interesting. Because it's not very often that we see different kinds of healers in the same game to, to, to this extent. In, I'm going to reference World of Warcraft a lot because I think it, it's a healthy medium that everyone can kind of understand. But in World of Warcraft, we have shamans, we have priests, we have druids, we have paladins, and monks. I think that's all the healers that I can think of right now. Uh, but they all feel pretty, pretty samey for the most part. You all manage your heals over time, or you manage your big heals and your little bit of protection abilities, right? Whereas with the Scholar, yeah, you heal less and shield more with most of your innate healing coming from your fairy. Your fairy itself has a bunch of regen abilities, protection abilities, and at later levels, you can actually just tell it to get out of here and improve your own personal healing for some quick bursts, which I think is really interesting. But moving into our casters, let's let's talk about Summoner real quick. Now, Summoner, everything I say now is probably going to be outdated because in, what, two months, we're going to be talking about Endwalker and the changes made to Summoner. But there's a lot to talk about because as it is right now, Summoner summons less than acts like a dot machine. You get two abilities as when you start Arcanist, which are going to be uh, Bio and Miasma, which are two damage over time abilities or dots. As the fight progresses, you'll have to keep these, these on a recurring timer, making sure that they're always up, because that's going to be your, your passive damage throughout the fight. What's really interesting about Summoner, though, is that as you progress through your, your quest, you'll unlock different summonable partners or companions. And most of these are, are pretty different. We have Ifrit, who is our single target damage. He, he's a big fire demon. But for you, he's a little tiny, he's a little baby fire demon. We have Garuda, who is our AOE pet, who does a lot of wind damage, big gusts of wind. And then we have Titan, who's more of a protective uh, summon. He, he, I haven't really seen a big use case for using Titan over Ifrit or Garuda. I mainly see people, a lot of people using Garuda during uh, large pulls in dungeons and Ifrit for boss fights, where you need to focus on one single target. But as we all know, in Endwalker, all of this is going to change anyways. We... If you haven't seen the video, definitely check it out right there. But it's it's insane. It's insane how much this is changing. I'm going to do a huge in-depth thing when that comes out. And we actually have our, our grubby little fingers on it. But uh, as for the other casters, they, they, as for the other caster, I should say, that you can choose, we have the Thaumaturge. Now, the Thaumaturge is another iconic beginning class because it evolves into Black Mage. Now, Black Mage is our very basic mage class. He specializes in fire, ice, and lightning magic. Throughout your leveling experience, you'll be casting fire spells, ice spells, and lightning spells. Now, lightning is going to be your damage over time effects. Your fire spells are going to be your huge damage because everyone loves a good fireball. And your ice is actually going to be helping generate mana. A cool little uh, feature of the Black Mage is that while your fire spells cost a lot of mana to cast, Ice spells will help you regenerate, and it's a, finding that strange balance between fire and ice magic will help you elongate your, your combat, helping you weave spells in and out through it. Um, but that's what I really love about this game, is that each class, each job feels so different, so refreshing. I'm not sitting there just being like, okay, I've played this class before, it's easy. Like, if, if you ask me how, how to play Shaman and WoW versus Balanced Druid, I'd be like, yeah, they're pretty... In my opinion, pretty functionally the same. You wanna make sure you keep your debuffs up, you wanna make sure your procs are going, and you wanna make sure you're hitting your major spam spell. But in Final Fantasy, it's a bit it's a bit more more complicated because you have to first start your rotation, right? You have to set your proc, set your dot, manage your buffs, manage your mana, and then later on in the game you will get another resource, which will be a huge damage boost. 
So as the, the longer you can stay in, in this particular mode, or Genoshian if you're familiar, uh, you can actually deal continued damage and have that st that steady stream of damage that I think is kind of missing from, from mages. Uh, I used to play a mage back in World of Warcraft, and it was just very proc heavy, and I wasn't a big fan of that, personally. So let's move on to something a little bit more physical, shall we? With our physical melee DPS, we have a couple that we can choose. The first of which, of course, being our pugilist. Now, if you're not familiar with what a pugilist is, that is someone who punches people, usually like a boxer. This is where we start to learn about positionals in Final Fantasy. Now, if you're not familiar with what that means, a positional is when you have to physically move your character either from the rear of your enemy or the flank of your enemy at, at the sides. This will give you a damage boost or potency boost in Final Fantasy terms. And it's honestly really great. Along with the Lancer, we see a lot more positionals being used. And I really, really love the fact that melee DPS isn't just sitting there spamming their keys, sitting in one position doing the same thing. You have to actually manage your, your physical positioning in a fight to get the most out of your job. Now, the, the Pugilist will actually turn into the Monk which will gain access to opening up your chakra, casting cool abilities, and dashing around the <laughs> dashing around the battlefield like like there's no tomorrow. Of course, if you if you ever want a good power fantasy, uh, you can just take a look at Tifa from Final Fantasy VII or Final Fantasy VII R, where uh, she definitely kicks some ass. Uh, meanwhile, we have our Lancer that evolves into Dragoon. The Dragoon is a very iconic class which you can see from FF9. If you ever played it, you'll notice that Freya was a Dragoon. She has cool abilities called jumping. Now jumping is not lost. Oh no, no, it's not lost. In fact, it's it's very prominent in the Dragoon rotation, being able to jump in and out of combat and deal damage and jump back out and prep your combo and go back in. And we're only getting more jumps as time goes on. So uh, if you like weaving in and out of combat and potentially jumping off a platform during a boss fight, I think Dragoon might be for you. And lastly, with our physical DPS, we have the Rogue. Now, the Rogue is another iconic class from Final Fantasy. We see that same beautiful small boy. We have our Zidanes. People can fight and say that Titus was a Rogue. I don't believe it, but they can say it. The stealing, the dual, dual dagger wielding character is back again. And believe it or not, they don't turn into a thief like one would expect in uh, in Final Fantasy. In this iteration, however, they do turn into the ninja. Now, the ninja is probably one of the most mechanically complex jobs you can play in the base game. With their skill ninjutsu, you're able to uh, press one of three buttons in a combination with the other two buttons of that, of that group and cast a different ability, whether it be throwing a giant shuriken or enhancing your own speed up to becoming a tiny little rabbit because you messed up. But the damage potential on Ninja is so high because I feel like the skill ceiling is right up there with it. Uh, play this job if you really want to play piano on your keyboard for a while. Uh, we're, we're only going to see some, some improved DPS coming from this job in Endwalker, so I think it's a safe bet if you're like, I really want to be Naruto Uzumaki. You know what I'm saying? And lastly, we have the Archer, our ranged physical DPS that came with Aroma Born. And let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. People talk a lot of smack about Bard and Archer, but sometimes it's nice just to sit back and, and shoot arrows at people, you know? Now, the Bard and the Archer have gotten a lot of hate recently just because there are other jobs in the game that people think function a lot better than it. But with the, with the change out coming from Endwalker, they may be getting a few new songs that will help boost their allies and, and deter their enemies. But we also get to see a lot more dots we also see a lot more power coming from them. So this is something to keep an eye on, but definitely if you want to, if you want to play a ranged physical, Arch is probably a good, a good starting point. Now, there are a couple of jobs that are going to be coming out uh, as you play through the game. Once you get to an area called Ishgard, you'll be able to unlock things like the Machinist, which is a, a man with a gun, uh, very similar to uh, Edgar in FF6. They will also have the Dark Knight, which is another tanking job. Uh, they use a two-handed sword as opposed to a two-handed axe, which some people may see, may, may get a little bit more attached to. Um, I still fight that the Dark Knight quest line is probably one of the best written uh, class quests that I've ever seen. Other things that I think that are really important here that I think a lot of people should understand is free companies. 
Now, free companies are basically your guild in the game. I would recommend getting into a free company if you can. Uh, of course, you can't do so on the free trial, but it is important if you ever decide to pick up the game to get into a free company as they can give you experience buffs and they can definitely help you out with clearing different content. Um, there are a couple resources for finding free companies in the game where you can basically look around. You can go to Party Finder and be like, hey, you guys, you guys need an FC mate, um, specifically if they're on your server. Additionally, you can go to the Lodestone and see who's, who's currently recruiting. I'll leave a link to that in the, in the, the uh, description down below for you guys. So the next big thing that I didn't really understand when I was getting into the game was brand companies. Now, think of a grand company like a faction in other MMOs where you basically fight for them and you're able to do quests and gain rep with them. But it's done a little bit differently because in the, in, in the story of Final Fantasy XIV, there's no real opposition between them it's more of what what city do you represent now for me my my fc and i all report to the immortal flames which are based out of a desert city uh but we uh it, there's not really a huge difference between them they do get different gear that you, you can pick up there's different quests you can do and you will represent a different group uh within pvp but i think the important part here is that you're pretty much free to choose whoever you want without any real impact you just might want to double check to see who your free company actually represents. Speaking of PvP, there are a couple of weird things about this. So PvP is uh, often seen as an afternote in Final Fantasy XIV, which is unfortunate for some people coming from things like ESO and World of Warcraft, because in those games, at least from my opinion, PvP is a little bit prominent. Uh, I often remember doing arenas trying to trying to hit higher ranks, but it never happened. I'm not very good at PvP. Don't at me. But uh, <laughs> But what's important here is the fact that doing PvP is, is so easy in Final Fantasy XIV to rank up and get rewards compared to other games. You can you can literally do four, four PvP matches and buy a piece of gear. That looks good to you. Now, most of the gear in, in PvP is cosmetic. It's not like World of Warcraft where you, you want to do PvP every week to make sure you get a, a chest unlock to maybe get that piece of gear you need. A lot of it's just going to be, does this armor look cool? Is this the glamour that I want to get? Because I feel like that's pretty important for a lot of people is understanding that you don't need to do PvP. It's just another aspect of the game that's really fun and interesting. And I feel like Final Fantasy resonates that way through a lot of their content is it's not a I need to do this. It's a I want to do this, if that makes sense. But moving on to uh, our last couple things. The first thing is all the different kinds of quests that you can unlock. So there's, uh, I believe there's four different kinds of quests in the game right now. There is your MSQ, which is going to be your main story quest, which is what you need to progress the story, the actual plot of the game. We have our blue unlock quests, which will unlock new content or features for you. Things like using glamours, new dungeons, new raids, new trials, stuff like that. Uh, we've also got our repeatable quests which are things you can repeat for reputation, or sometimes it's just for a, uh, a nice little reward. And then lastly, we have our side quests. Our side quests basically allow us to learn a little bit more about some of the other characters in the area while giving experience to your, uh, your other jobs. Um, additionally, if you ever find yourself in a, in a spot where you can't progress the main story scenarios because of your gear level or what have you, you can always go to a, a, a main city and purchase gear from a vendor. Uh, they're in all the main cities that you can purchase gear from. Uh, they'll be in Ulda, they'll be in Limsa Liminsa, and they'll also be in, in Mania as well. And that should help you out with getting at least started a little bit in Final Fantasy. Uh, there have been some times where I've been kind of gear stuck and I was like, oh, I don't know what to do. And then a buddy of mine says, why don't you just buy gear? I was like, I don't have that kind of money to buy from, from the market board auction house. But says, no, just, just go talk to this guy. So I go talk to him buy gear for, for a, a little bit of chump change and, uh, you know, we can progress. But what do you guys think about that? Do you guys have, have any questions about Final Fantasy in general? Are you looking to get started in the game? Do you have questions about it? Anything I can answer? I'd, I'd, I'd love to do some more content on Final Fantasy considering how much of my time I actually put into the game. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really pumped to, to kind of see where things go. And, uh, I'm really excited to see what we see in Endwalker. I can't wait until the media tour mid in mid October, but uh, we'll see that when we see it. If you got to this point in the video, throw the video a like. That always helps me out. And subscribe if you're not subscribed for, for more Final Fantasy content.
But uh, as always, don't see you. I'll see you later.